So, um, you know, for the last several months, I've been pushing um, our local leagues to reach out to, to their school boards to convince them to join the lawsuit. And I'm really glad, Barbara, that your league is very focused on the lawsuit because, it's in, as you have said, this may be the only option we have for um, for really ch for stopping this uh, huge erosion of public funds away from the public schools. Um, so I um, I thought before um, it, it would be important for all of us to have a common understanding of the whole voucher picture and privatization in Ohio. I can't ask you to go off and sell an idea if you don't have a really good uh, confident sense of understanding what's going on. So tonight's presentation is a simple overview of vouchers in Ohio, as well as the lawsuit. Um, and then we can focus a little bit on how to approach your school board. And many of you have a lot of experience with that, and I'd appreciate your understanding, your suggestions on how to do it. But it is um, what we need to do. And I think one of the interesting things is the local level often, when the world is falling apart, the local level is still where you have the best access to your elected officials, you have the relationships, and it's the time to use them. And um, this is, happens to be an issue that needs to be dealt with at the local school board level. There are two ways to support um, the voucher lawsuit. Uh, one is to get a, your school district on board, and the other is at this point to um, join the lawsuit itself with, uh, in an, with an amicus brief. And our, the League of Women Voters of Ohio has been asked to do that. And the state board agreed to do it. And we're still kind of na navigating whether to sign on to another brief that someone else is um, developing, but it all has to happen by Friday. So I hope that goes forward. So um, on January 4th uh, of this year, about 100 school district filed suit in the Franklin County Common Pleas Court challenging the constitutionality of um, the state ed choice and ed choice expansion vouchers. Um, it's the beginning of a two to three year process. Uh, so this is something that will happen over the long haul. It's a challenge to the state constitution. Education is built into state constitutions. Every state has a provision for the funding and operating of a system of public schools. So this isn't a federal case, this is a state case. Um, so uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, in Ohio, there are three ways in which we are privatizing education. So as an, an organization like ours that is profoundly committed to a system of public education, we have to be concerned about the privatizing. And the, what happens when what these three things have in common is they use public funds uh, for individuals to opt out of public, of public schools. So there's no oversight by a local, a local elected board of education for funds that are leading school districts. And the emphasis is on individual choice and not the common good. So it's a, in, in many ways, a, a real rejection of the basics and the basic prim principles of public education. So there are three ways in which we do it in Ohio. The first is vouchers. Um, and these are also euphemistically referred to as scholarships. And I think people often confuse vouchers and charter schools. They are different. So a voucher is a tuition scholarship, I might add, not based on need or um, merit, um, to an existing private school. Now, I, uh, the state, I think, has, I think there's 795 registered um, private, uh, state chartered private schools in Ohio. A private school has to agree to accept vouchers. You don't have a choice. The, the school itself has to agree to participate in the voucher program, and it has the choice of what children are admitted. Uh, so even if you got a voucher, or you have to first be admitted. So as the, ad, the proponents in this lawsuit like to say, this is not about school choice. This is about schools choosing. Um, and I think it's an important point to make. Um, the, the second way is charter schools. So these schools were created over the last 20 to 25 years, depending on states permitting their being created, um, which are quasi public in that they use public funds. 
Um, but they are they have they lack any other kind of accountability. So a charter school then there's a given amount um, of tuition that is attached to every child that selects to use a charter school and that is free. And I don't believe that charter schools are as selective, but they may be selective uh, as well. Um, we know that some charter schools are for profit. They're operated by for profit organizations and some of them are not. We have online charter schools and we have brick and mortar charter schools. So there's a lot of variety within the charter school industry. And while they like to argue that they are public, most people at, by this point understand that they are not. Um, the third way in which we privatize things is through tax credits. And we've recently passed task, tax credits to, uh, I think you can get $250 to cover homeschooling costs. And there's another one that is a $500 tax credit for things like music lessons. Uh, and this was recently passed. So uh, there's uh, a, a quiet and constant effort to expand the use of public funds for private choices. Next one. So in Ohio, we have five different voucher programs. Uh, each was started at a different time, and they um, are for a, targeted a different kind of population. So the very first one was, was started in 1996, and that's the Cleveland Scholarship Program. Um, and it was justified as a way to um, save the children of Cleveland from their failing public schools. There wasn't any interest in investing in the public schools so that all children would benefit from a state interest in the quality of education. They just decided to uh, create an escape valve for some. And the value of a, I, the value of a um, voucher doesn't necessarily cover the full cost of uh, private school tuition. So in many ways, this was really a limited opportunity to those who had adequate, sufficient funds to pay the rest of the cost of a private education. So um, at, at this point, there, this year in 2021, um, seventh, that's the number of vouchers that are, were awarded to, to Cleveland kids. The second one was started in 2003. It was exclusively for aut children with autism and um, it, it allowed a $23,000 scholarship. And um, at this point, that's the number of students that are using them. The autism number um, pretty, is, remains very stable because that's a limited population. Um, and and that, so that, that's that one. Ed Choice, which we call the traditional Ed Choice, was started in 2005. And these are the vouchers that are triggered by a school, an individual school having um, low test scores on the state tests. Um, and for a very long time, it was a very small number of schools um, in a small number of school districts. Um, the, the value of the voucher has increased over time. And in the last state budget, it was raised for high school kids from $6,000 to 7,500. And from, for elementary kids from 4,500 to 5,500. It continues over time. Um, the value goes up and the restrictions and the targeting has completely disappeared. So it used to be that you had to leave, be enrolled in a public school to receive a voucher. And now you don't. So it's um, no longer uh, really based on this. And, and I would have to say, using the state test scores as the trigger um, by definition is um, a discriminatory practice that, that these haven't been challenged on that, but we know test scores are more of a function of income than they are of the quality of the education, but they're being used as a measure of quality. So it's a misuse of test scores. Um, and so it's a, it's a problem. Uh, John Peterson was started in 2012, and this is, a, again, this is a voucher program for children with disabilities, so it went beyond the autism. And so these vouchers were, depending on what your diagnosis is, it can be anywhere from $7,200 to now it's up to $35,000. So um, again, these also sort of fall in a narrow range, uh, although they have been growing recently. In 2014, they weren't satisfied with the Ed Choice um, uh, being based on um, 
test scores and it created a new program that allowed um, vouchers for people um, at 200% of poverty. Over time, they have increased that level. So it's less and less, once again, a program for, chil for children living in poverty. It didn't have restrictions on test scores or where they were lived. It started by um, phasing in one grade level at a time, and then one year they just gave them all. So again, there's this demonstrative pattern over time of making it more and more uh, making them more and more available regardless of the uh, category of, of voucher. So this school year, there were, or the 2021 school year, it's always a year behind and they're reporting the data. So there were 69,713 vouchers used. Um, there are about 1.6 million students in Ohio. So this is a small percentage of the students, but I believe 10% of the, they are 10% of the students, but they use 25% of the state money that's spent on public school, on, on education. Next one. So in the, in the most recent two-year budget, which actually ended deduction funding and um, did uh, approve most of the fair school funding plan, it also just accelerated privatization again. So this is, they increased the value of the vouchers. Uh, they removed any cap on the number of vouchers allowed. Uh, they started these, these tax credit um, schemes and uh, they expanded who a sibling was so that more and more people in a family could use a voucher if one child in their family used a voucher. Um, and it's very clear that you don't ever have to have been enrolled in a public school to use this. So it's a total farce as far as that being the re rationale for this program. So um, I've been tracking the use of ed choice and this is the traditional program. Um, so starting uh, in 2016, and it did start earlier than that, but the voucher use you can see has grown incrementally year to year. And for a very long time, it was just 40 school districts that were affected. They are the poorest school districts in the state that have the high, high concentration of children who live in poverty and children who are minorities. About 85% of the students in these districts are non-white. So that's where the vouchers have mostly been. So in 2020, um, the, they changed the criteria and the number of districts went up to 140. And the next year it was about to explode to 450 districts or something, and they couldn't have that. So they once again changed the criteria for where what kind of districts um, uh, could receive an ed choice voucher. So it, at that point, now vouchers are ed choice vouchers are only available in the in a school district where 20% of the children are identify, identified as Title I. So these are only now in the high poverty school districts and only in individual school buildings that fell on the lowest 20% of uh, test scores. So this helped uh, curb some of the hysteria and activism around this issue. So it's now 87 districts but I would like to say that the voucher law allows that once you receive a voucher, you are entitled to it for your whole education. So even though there's some school districts that are no longer um, school voucher districts, they still have to honor that over time. So there's still, so, so the voucher number will always continue to grow as new kids take them and as children continue to renew them until they graduate. And we haven't ha had them quite long enough to have that completely, uh, you know, to, to reach their maximum amount that just has to do with um, kids continuing on. That was sort of garbled, but <laughs> it's, they're still gonna grow. I don't have the comparable numbers for uh, the Ed Choice expansion um, and I should get those, but they, um, I think it's about 20,000 this year of Ed Choice expansion, and that number is growing the fastest, faster than Ed Choice traditional because there are fewer constraints on it. <laughs> yes. 
So uh, this is the, uh, and part of this, I don't know if the whole, um, oh, I see. So the whole slide is there. This shows the cost and how it's changed over time. So it started out at like about $48 million. It was about $50 million in um, 2006. Uh, and now it's over 650. That's putting the two edge choice um, programs together. So it's a really expensive option. Since about the annual increase in state funding for public education that would get us to full funding was about 350 million a year. So if that money weren't being diverted to vouchers, we would be getting there very quickly. Okay, next one. So um, this is, I mean, the, the constant growth in the backpack bill, House Bill 290, um, made it, which would be universal vouchers, made it really, really clear that the legislature is completely, has, pri has prioritized privatization. And the way to stop this, you, they just had to do a lawsuit. So, um, so the, the lawsuit, I just wanna, the, there are five main um, charges in the lawsuit. Um, and you, you don't have to know, and I, I urge you to read the lawsuit. It's very readable and it's very informative. But the five basic things are, um, it charges that by having a voucher program, and they, oh, I wanna say they only focused on Ed Choice vouchers. They did not do all the programs, all the voucher options. I think that was a political decision about not wanting to say they don't support special education. I, I don't know, but um, that that is a narrower focus because it's actually a broader, it reaches the whole population. Um, so it's they allege first that it's creating two systems of public education and the constitution really doesn't have any space for more than one, a, a thorough and efficient system, which is a one school district system. Um, again, it questions that this, this violates the DeRolf case, which requires a thorough and efficient system of common schools. It undermines the full funding of the public system. Um, it encourages segregation. Um, and it, uh, it also, the separation of church and state, um, which was really the grounds for the first challenge to the um, voucher case to vouchers, which happened, um, it's called the Zellman case, and it, it challenged the Cleveland Scholarship Program. They said that uh, it did not constitute a violation of the separation of church and state. At this point, they we this lawsuit suit still charges that, but it isn't the primary argument. And um, so I, I don't think that um, it will be dismissed because of that. Um, and it, it alleges um, uh, a violation of equal protection that, that actually public school children and private school children are not being treated equally um, because of this difference in the investment of state funds to each category. So those are the main, main issues in the case. So um, as we try to convince local school districts to join the case, I, I've developed these four primary um, talking points. And um, I, I hope they're convincing and it may be different depending on who your school board is. But first of all, I think the main thing is that this is a threat to the system of public education. And while we think of our local school districts as the full extent of our responsibility, actually they are, we are all part of a public system. So a threat to the public system is a threat to every school district in the state. And so the public system needs to be um, standing up to this. So the plaintiffs and the, and the our school districts in this case, so, um, and individual students, um, they, Vouchers put public schools in direct competition with private schools for state funds. And without sufficient state investment, our public system can't deliver what our communities need. So this 
primary, primary responsibility of the state, which is to operate the public system. It can't achieve that if, they're, if you're competing with private schools for limited public dollars. Um, <laughs> in the state budget, the funds for charter schools, vouchers, and public schools are all in the same line item. And I don't know if that means there, there were if there were specific appropriations for each of those items, but they're actually commingled. I quite, can't quite understand that, but still, they are in direct competition in any case. Um, the, they in, uh, certainly, the fact that they increase segregation and primary and really shift more of the burden for school funding to local taxpayers. Every time the state fails to improve that their contribution, it's the local community that takes up the uh, makes up the difference. And every community now, because it used to be that only those school districts um, that had failing schools were affected. Now every community is affected because all the money is coming directly out of the state and um, you've got to be fighting with the state for where that money goes. Um, and again, the threat continues to grow. We know that House Bill 290 will make this uh, individual choice. Um, it, it, it now no longer justifies this as a, a way to solve a problem. It's now asserting that, um, that education is an individual choice. It isn't about the common good. Uh, so it's a fundamental shift in thinking about the purposes of why we have a public system at all. So those are my strongest arguments by, for why a school district should stand up and join the lawsuit. So um, that's what I'm hoping people will be able to negotiate and, and have conversations with their school board members about um, and convince them to join the suit. Are these slides going to be made available to, uh, do you have, can we pick up those slides just? Yeah. Okay, the, the, the thing is on funding, um, uh, as I understand it, with the law that was passed, they do now not have the funds flow out of the individual school. So, right. you know, then people act like that doesn't. But what happens is even worse because they have now, they, they adjusted the formula so that uh, uh, the portion that the state must pay for the students in that school district is to, so that the, the, the that it isn't unborn in an unfair way on the local taxpayer's ability to pay. So that means a poor district is getting more help from the state. But what that not paying out does is that the state's money that's available per student, since they have- Is decreased. Really, yes, is prioritized. And that, that money is, makes it so that poor school, the wealthy school districts, it's fine because they can raise whatever they want and it isn't gonna, but for the, for most, for the average and below average in terms of what local ability to fund it. So you may not have in a Southern area, you may not be competing with quote, any school choice places, but the funds that comes to your school and you have no way else to get them from the state are gonna be sharply reduced because they're sending it after something. And I have to tell you, I sat at a volleyball, at a, at a soccer game indoors in Cleveland, as this was being discussed, and one mother sitting, teching to the person next to me, my son-in-law, was explaining how with all this other, both of their children, they could keep both of their children in private schools because of the money following the student. Yeah. And they I, I just want to add that I didn't really touch on this, but in the, initially all of this was funded with deduction funding, which meant that the local school district had to pay a big part of the cost of a voucher, which is why those districts that were affected, you know, they, it made the other districts that did, that did not have, you know, the other 
570 didn't feel vulnerable because deduction funding wasn't affecting them. Deduction funding ended, but it means that the funding is now coming out of the whole pot that should be divided amongst public school districts and that a much smaller part of that pot is available because it's going yes. to privatization. At least didn't Bill Phyllis have something that showed right now that more money from the state follows a voucher student right. per than comes to the poorest school district. And I mean, that is really like the other things, that's really false advertising. It was done simply, simply to try to take the pressure off so people wouldn't think they were losing dollars because of vouchers. But as we're just saying, the important thing to understand is they are and more and more money for which they have no oversight. Yeah. So in my school district this year, we get about $1,100 per public school student. And every voucher student in the community who's in high school gets $7,000. Yep. So, or $7,500. Right. So yeah. the amount of money going into our community's voucher, uh, private schools, is more than seven times the amount of money that's going into the public schools. And I think that's a very powerful thing to understand. And um, that's where the equal protection argument in this case is focusing. It's really on the amount of state money per student that's go, the difference in that um, for between public and private school students who reside in the same community. Because it's very different one community to the next depending on the property wealth of that community. So yes, it's a, it's a pretty, I think that's a very um, powerful argument. I think, I think that's one of the most important ones to push with school boards to yeah. join the suit because they are not responsibly representing their de district, no matter what political ideas they have, if they are not securing the funding, which is basic for their district, their fair share of it. And this along, I mean, with the other nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, how do you, you, you show, this is an experiment, right? Has the experiment has cost us, let's see, a 60 billion, uh, 60 with the ECOT scandal. It has cost us all kinds of stuff. And has it improved? No, we know that the study that was done, we have not improved at all. This whole thing that we've invested all this testing and the other money has not improved public education. Nor has it improved outcomes for the students who use the private option. Their performance isn't better. No, I, no. So, it, you know, the, the rationale doesn't match the reality and um, that's difficult. <laughs> you don't try an experiment, quote, and then after 20 years, try more of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's failed. There, um, Marianne, there is an accountability issue. There are a couple of them. Well, that's one what I was is, wondering, yeah. Yeah, one is that, you know, the, well, through the, there isn't any accountability to an elected board of education for oversight of any of the funds that go into a private school. And, they, so, and, they, and there's no rec requirement that they turn over their accounting to the state or anything like that. Well, I think there's a certain amount of accounting, but I don't think the, the transparency is required. The, the rigor doesn't come close. Okay. And then the other thing that we put accountability ar around is testing. I was wondering so, about that. So I, a student who uses a voucher actually has to take the state's test, mm -hmm. but their school has no consequences. So high stakes testing applies to public schools, but testing applies to private schools. So you can, you take the test, but there's no grading of the private school or, you know, no, it doesn't trigger anything. So, so it's that, a it, doesn't, it doesn't trigger, but they did, don't you remember, it's about, what would it be now? three years, four years, the state study showed in fact that the voucher schools did not do as well as the public schools. That's right. there, it's documented. In fact, the headlines, uh, the, the, the headlines on it was a good lesson in uh, what newspapers can do. Newspapers run the AP story, but they write their own headlines. And so some newspapers in Ohio, uh, 
used the headline instead of the fact they were not doing as well, actually used the headline that was the excuse they gave. Yes, the reason why the schools that aren't voucher schools are doing better is because of the competition they've gotten from these quote unquote oh. really basically failing voucher schools. I mean, it's incredible. Yeah. I hope that answers it, Marianne. Well, so, and also uh, very there, different rules apply to each school. And are there any curricular requirements or no. um, discriminatory requirements? No, you can discriminate in a private school. And that's one of the things that's just aggravating. Because apparently, apparently Maine was very effective in getting around that nasty um, Supreme Court ruling by having LGBT discriminatory rules for all schools, even those who accept vouchers, oh. made a huge impact on how many schools yeah. would accept it. So last week, there was a US Supreme Court decision in the voucher case related to Maine, which was a religious grounds. That's what I was talking about. Yeah. And uh, the, the vouchers hurt Ohio folks came out very quickly saying that has no relevance to this. Well, then, so don't give well, up. <laughs> it's still relevant. It, 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 I mean, in Ohio, it's a moot point because Ohio already gives that funds to religious schools. Yeah. Well, we, the Zellman case made that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but I, I, just, I just thought question. that the accountability issue is another, I think, an important one to bring up in, yeah. in these arguments. Good point. Yeah, Bob. The, um, the other thing uh, with special ed vouchers. Um, they, that process still required the public school of residents to go to all and to monitor all the IEPs. Yeah, they had to the do the assessment and write the IEPs. Yeah. And, then, and, you know, I guess part of that is if, if you take the student, you, you take everything that with the federal requirements and make that their responsibility. Yeah. And, yeah. It put public schools in <clears throat> the special ed people who had to go to these meetings in a private school, very awkward situation. And the parents made a decision to leave that public school. So they were typically not interested in going back. So mm -hmm. whatever concerns were raised by the public school angered the parent. <laughs> you know, it's it. it they really need to take the whole control. And if a parent has an issue, it should be the responsibility of private school to go through the special ed mediation, just like a public school would have to do if there's a problem with the education of a, of a special ed student. Yeah. But then, again, it's this different set of rules for different people. Um, do you, but, uh, before I forget, do you have a list of all the students or schools that don't uh, haven't haven't joined okay so if you go to uh, google vouchers hurt ohio go to their website and it one of the if you click through it it lists every school district that has joined so what's of, what's the website it's vouchers hurt ohio oh, okay. com. <laughs> yeah, and, and not only that they will tell you who they make a distinction between who belongs to ohio uh, OEA, that is, and those people who have not belonged but have not joined the lawsuit. So you can, on your school districts, this is what we have done here, is there are school districts who belong but have not joined the lawsuit right. and other school districts who have joined the lawsuit. And of course, in, in some cases, there are school districts that haven't joined, but that's fewer. So. Um, it also includes the state, the joinder statement that a school district has to approve in order to join the lawsuit. And joining the lawsuit is a two dollar per student fee. And I, one of the push, one of the things that I've heard from school board members as I've tried to talk them into it, it was sort of like, well, why would we spend that kind of money? Somebody else is spending it, and sort of the sense that it isn't their responsibility, not connecting that they are as affected as anybody else and they shouldn't be free riders. It takes, it's gonna take everybody both to invest in the lawsuit and to stand for the lawsuit for it to have real legs. So um, anyway, so I, I wanted to know if from your experience, many school boards 
one of the things that they don't like to do is pass a resolution unless it's unanimous. Uh, and I don't know how many school districts operate that way. So I, I think it is very important that you contact both the su superintendent and every school board member to talk to them about this. And I believe most school boards are happiest if when you come to their public comment and bring your idea or your encouragement for them to take action, they're more likely to love you if you've talked to them first and you're not surprising them out of nowhere. So that's my little bit of advice. And all of you have been around the block with school boards. So please share your best thoughts about how to move a school board to come to support this.